of your Spirit upon each of our lives. For Lord, we desire to draw nigh, to come close, that the heavens might open, that we might partake. Lord, we thank you. We acknowledge you as our Lord personally, Lord, each of us. We submit, Lord, gladly our lives before you, asking, Lord, only that you bring forth your very purpose, your will, your desire from within each of our lives. And we thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Grant it, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, move within and touch our lives deep, deep within, Lord. Reorient us, whatever it may be within us, Lord, that's bent towards the earthly, lift it towards the heavenly. Enable us to look up. Create within us, Lord, the ability to look with expectancy in anticipation, to look, Lord, with desire for your appearing to long for it, Lord. Create that within us. Set us free from the hindrances. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we look to you, Lord, as we continue that indeed, Lord, we might hear from heaven that our lives might be touched. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand and open our spirit and our heart. Amen. If anyone met the Lord in a special way this week and would like to share it, it'll end up in the bulletin, in the Pinecrest Bulletin, and there's a couple notices up on the board, so if you'd check for Fran, just ask for Fran up front before you leave and just share with her and really appreciate. The testimonies mean a lot. So if there is anything, just let Fran know. Amen. Father, we thank you now. We open our hearts, our spirits, and in the time we have, we ask, Lord, that you might move upon us within us, that you might move through us. Prepare us, Lord. Help us. Truly, Lord, we would ask the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we might enter in and possess that which you have for us. Teach us, Lord, of your ways. Grant us that anointing, Lord, that we may both speak forth and hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and you may be seated. Revelation chapter 4 for just a moment. We've been there all week. And behold, I stand at the door. And then he looked and he heard a voice. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. We're at the end of the church age. There's nothing any further. We've come to the end. We're in that season, that time in the closing out of the church age, the birthing of the kingdom age, and the Lord is moving in preparation to prepare a people for his eternal purpose. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. That's prophetic revelation, very specific revelation. It's revelation that will energize, that will equip us. A, trunk, a trumpet is the call to action. And the Lord is preparing. All creation is groaning for the manifestation. That's the trumpet, that call. The body of overcomers. I do not believe that the visible church is ever going to come to unity. In fact, if it does, that which they decide on to bring unity will be so watered down, it'll be worthless. But rather, within the church, the real church is not what you see on Sunday morning. But the real church are those that are within that which you see who are really committed to the Lord. 
I think you know that. Whatever church you attend, within that church are a deeply committed group that's small by comparison to the whole. A voice of a trumpet. There's a tremendous unity. The apostolic is about to be restored. In the restoration of the apostolic, the Lord is not so much restoring apostles, but rather an apostolic anointing in the body that will function through the body, through the church. That has to do with, with consequence. The earth was without form and void and darkness moved on the face of the deep. And the Lord said, let there be light and there, see, let there be and there was. That's the creative word. That's going to be restored. And the Lord is preparing a people that he can trust with that word, to use it wisely and rightly. Hallelujah. I heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. That's the present word. Come up out of the earthly into the heavenly. Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That is a valid prayer. We should all be praying that. That the Lord might bring us into the place of understanding. Israel saw the deeds of God, but Moses the ways. There's a big difference between seeing what the Lord does and understanding the principles and that which is behind that which he does. Come up and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, and this is where we're at, the Lord's getting us ready. Immediately I was where? In the spirit. Now we're not quite there yet. You know, we, it takes a little bit of time. But the Lord's getting us ready. He's getting a people ready that are going to become very receptive, responsive, alert, spiritually alert. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne. That's governmental. The throne relates to the kingdom in operation. Divine authority or power. It has to do with the church beginning to move in spiritual authority. Now for just one moment, Isaiah chapter 14 concerning the kingdom. Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 6, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 6. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, Satan has been active throughout the church age. There's an active warfare against the body of Christ in a very simple, practical way. Any one of us, I think, I think you can relate to what I'm going to say. It's very simple. You can be absolutely alert, wide awake, and you feel I'm going to sit down and pray or read my Bible. What happens? You fall asleep. <laughs> now that doesn't just happen. There's a warfare, an active warfare against spirituality, against our seeking of the Lord. Many of us have had this experience again and again. We felt that we've got, finally, we've made it, we've got everything in order, and we just feel so good, we've met the Lord, we've got all our, everything, we just saw, and we, now we're ready. And the next thing we know, everything has fallen apart. And then we're, we're getting up out of the dust, brush, brushing ourselves off and getting ready to start again. He who has smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. There's an active warfare against each and every one of us, especially those who have made a commitment to the Lord. Once we make that commitment, when we really become sincere and we make that commitment to the Lord, guaranteed we're going to begin to have problems beyond what we had known before. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted. That spiritual authority being restored to the church. This is an end time truth. And this has to do with the bringing down of principalities and powers and the establishing of the kingdom of God. None hindereth. What's the result? 
the millennium. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The world is full of anger, hatred today. And it says the whole earth is at rest. The world is at anything but rest today. The reason for it is not so much political decisions and things, but rather it's principalities and powers in the heavens. And we have an authority. Many of us the Lord has burdened. I have a very specific dealing of the Lord and burden, a, a spiritual responsibility for Iran. I've been dealt with, glory. Hmm. I've been dealt with by the Lord specifically about that nation. Others have been dealt with, a specific area, a nation in some way, you see. And, and, and the principalities, as we pray, as we believe, as, as through our little acts of obedience, an act of obedience as simple as walking by a piece of paper on the floor and the Lord saying, go back and pick it up and put it in the wastebasket. That's stupid in itself, but it's an act of obedience that becomes like a trigger and it releases the Lord to do some much greater thing. Because in the simplicity of our obedience, we've released the Lord to do something because we responded in a very simple thing but in our obedience you see God's not arbitrary and simple acts of obedience therefore when we become spiritually sensitive see immediately I was where in the spirit the whole earth is at rest and quiet they break forth into singing Romans tells us that the kingdom of God is righteousness that's all opposition, those things, the, the pulls of the flesh that are activated by the enemy, those things dealt with and silenced. Righteousness, which will result in peace. The whole earth is at rest. The result is peace when Satan is brought down, principalities, powers, the enemy that wars against us. And then there's a manifestation of joy. I've often said that righteousness and peace get together and get married and have a child named Joy. <laughs> Amen. So then this is the kingdom. The fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellers come up against it. This is powerful. And it has to do with an overcoming people beginning to function in spiritual authority, that restoration, the sound of a trumpet, that apostolic authority that's going to be released into the body of Christ. The Lord preparing a people that he can trust with that authority and then we begin to pray, move, become active in, in, in dealing with principalities, powers. Now, a, a very present word. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 3. To the intent that when, now. I have a book on how to talk Southern. <laughs> Someone gave it to me one time and I really tried for so many years to move to South Carolina, move Pinecrest, and I was practicing my Southern. So I can't say this the way our friends can, but, but see, but to the intent that when, now. See, the way they would say that is ra now. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's it. See, this is the present word. Amen. So I just want to make sure that we're hearing it. Right now. <laughs> See, this is the present word. That now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, this is what I've been sharing out of, out of Isaiah, might be known by who? By who? The church. Who's that? That's us might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That manifold wisdom, I've been sharing this all week, is that we, weak, with all kinds of problems, that, we've come to where, that we will come to the place where we stop feeling sorry for ourselves and limiting ourselves because of our problems and begin to believe what the book says. And that we step into that place, we begin to receive that spiritual authority and begin to activate it Ask the Lord the area that we're to pray, that we're to believe for. The Lord will give it. each one of us a, a place, an area that we'll be burdened for. 
our home area, our, it could be our home, our town, our church. So then the Lord is preparing a people. This is an operation of the kingdom. And our part in the kingdom is not so much to take over to run for a political office, you know, and get all the political offices filled with Christians. That, that's not it. But it's the church becoming activated and dealing with principalities and powers where they're bound, where they're dealt with. And the result being, since the feller has been laid down, there, there's peace. And all the trees of the field begin, that's the nations, begin to rejoice. So then the Lord is preparing us. I looked, and a voice said, come up, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. That's governmental. Now that has to do with the kingdom. And we're in a special time of preparation. Salvation's a free gift. We believe and we're saved. The kingdom requires a qualification. The principles of the kingdom, and we're not going to get into it, but it's the Sermon in the Mount. And the Sermon in the Mount begins with this. Blessed are the poor, the bankrupt. Blessed are they who come to the end of self, for theirs is heaven. Is that what it says? No, theirs is what? The kingdom. It has nothing, it's not, the Sermon in the Mount does not relate to salvation. It's the qualifications for the kingdom. And so the Lord's preparing a people. The kingdom simply means that we submit ourselves to that processing that we're going to be available to him for his purposes. Now for just a moment, just real quickly, I'm not going to get into this, but one of the most, I believe, one of the most profound chapters in all the Bible is Matthew chapter 13. This has nothing to do with salvation. This chapter has to do with the kingdom. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. It'd be easy to spend an entire week of services just on this one chapter. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now verse 19 tells us what he was sowing. Verse 18, now hear ye the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of what? The kingdom. See, so he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about preparation for the kingdom. When anyone heareth the kingdom, the word of the kingdom. Now, there's something that the Lord showed me here. In verse 9 of Matthew 13, Jesus said, He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, he isn't talking about this. <laughs> See, not, not this, but it's the inner ear of the spirit that we're hearing beyond the physical we're not hearing words but we're hearing spirit and life that's entering into our spirit and the disciples asked him why he's speaking in parables now verse 11 he answered and he said to them because it is given to you to know the mysteries of what the kingdom of heaven but to them it's not giving given it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom but to them it's not given to you, it's given. To them, it isn't. When I saw that, I started to pray, a very simple prayer. And I prayed this intently. Lord, I want to be a you and not a them. <laughs> That's what it's, it's given to you, but not to them. Lord, I want to be a you. Reveal, show me. Unfold, teach me, Lord. Open my understanding concerning the kingdom. A sower went forth to sow. This has to do with the preparation of our lives where we come to the place where the Lord can use us concerning spiritual authority, for that's his purpose, is to bring to an end the works of Satan. And because Satan deceived mankind, the Lord's going to use from amongst mankind a people that's going to bring him down and destroy his kingdom. But it's going to be done through the, an overcoming body from within the church. Now... When he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. When you plant a garden, it's got a nice little row that's all hoed, fixed, you know, and you fertilize it and you carefully put seed. Well, there's a path on the side. That path is probably about a foot and a half or two foot away from that row. It's very close, but the soil is packed. It's hard because you walk on it. And that furrow, you see, 
to be out of the will of God is not that far away. In fact, if any one of us are out of the will of God, the will of God is only one step from where we are. Lord, I'm out of your will. I repent. I apologize. I ask forgiveness. Now, Lord, I'm going to take a step. And I take one step. Now, Lord, I'm in your will by faith. Now I'm going to walk. The Lord will accept that. He'll hear it. And we'll begin. And we're in his will. Just one step. It's not some great complicated thing. It's just one step. That wayside, that pathway, just one step. That then the seed falls into fertile soil. The Lord begins. The revelation begins to flow. Some fell in stony places. The word of the Lord was to come up stony places if our pockets are full of stones we're not going anywhere the scripture says casting aside every sin and the weights that so easily beset us weights are not necessarily sin but they're things that what they hold us down they hinder stones they hinder but other fell and some fell among thorns and I feel the Lord gave me an example for this thorns roses are beautiful to look at but never hug a rose bush <laughs> i think you get the point if you've ever taken a hold of a of a of a, of a ro you know a beautiful rose on on a stem and you took a hold of it you probably ended up with some blood on your fingers those things are sharp well some people are like that they look beautiful from a distance but when you get close there's those sharp opinions attitudes See, the wayside, I'm out of the will of God. Stones, there are things that need to be. See, the wayside, I deal with the submission of my life to the will of God. The stones, I deal with things that are hindering my walk. The thorns, I deal with attitudes, opinions that I have that hinder. The result is good soil, which brings forth 30, 60, 100 fold. So there's that work. And so the Lord preparing a people for the work of the kingdom. Now there's a process in this. The kingdom means that I'm submitted to divine authority. The Lord showed me this one time in the sense that in the year of Jubilee, all slaves were set free. And, but if a slave had a benevolent master and wanted to remain, that slave could go to the master, give up their freedom. He went beyond that, he became a love slave. Adam and Eve gained their freedom. The tree of life meant submission, dependence. Man was created to be dependent. And Adam and Eve lost that dependence. They chose to be independent, to decide for themselves, to know good and evil. In other words, to make decisions totally apart from God. So they gained their independence, their freedom. The Lord will never take it. That's why the word says, if anyone will come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross if anyone because we gained our freedom only we can give it up the year of jubilee i was born free my parents the adam and eve begot so and so who begot so and so who begot so and so who begot wade taylor they chose to be free from submission to the authority the tree of life to a place of dependence where they were dependent to the lord jesus the last Adam took that place. He said, of, I do of myself what? Nothing. See, I do of myself nothing. He was totally submitted to the will of his father. And he lived that out in obedience. At the first Adam failed. The last Adam did it. And so I was born free, independent from God. I'm saved. But as, see, I'm saved. So now I've got a garment. A, an animal was slain. Adam and Eve were covered with that garment. My sins are forgiven. But within me, you see, they ate something. And the Lord didn't tell them to regurgitate it. They ate it. The right to their own lives. We can give that up. The Lord will never take it. And when I saw this, I was in a service, and the Lord showed me the whole thing, that I still have the right to my own life, absolutely saved by saying, Lord, I want your best. I want to go further. I want to be submitted. And the Lord showed me that I had within me the right to my own life. When I saw it, I literally, it was so intense, I'll never forget. I went up, I interrupted a service, stood behind the pulpit, publicly gave up the right to my own life. And all at once, the edge of the pulpit became a doorpost. 
And I, I got my ear right down on the edge of the pulpit and asked the Lord to pierce it. You see, and if we're wise, if you haven't done it, get alone. Make sure you think it through. Because I've complained to the Lord about some things pretty loudly. And the Lord let me know that I gave up my rights and that now I'm submitted and I've got to accept that which he places in my path and work my way through it. You see, because I gave up my rights. So then, we need to get alone and give up. The kingdom means that we've given up the right when we make him king. We may, we may just know our savior, the baptizer, the healer. We know Jesus in all those dimensions. But when we come as king, we've given up the right to our own life. Only we can do that. And we make him Lord. Once we do that, then we come under a special operation of grace. Now, in the Old Testament, we're going to look at a verse. For, it's Exodus chapter 19. Genesis, Exodus chapter 19. Moses came, this is, or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 19, verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, laid before their, their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Question, did they? No. See, we really can't. We cannot keep the law. We cannot. See, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. That's the old covenant law. But in the New Covenant, we're going to look at it. It's in Ezekiel, and this is powerful. Ezekiel chapter 26 and verse 36. Ezekiel chapter 26. This is the very heart of the New Covenant. Well, now I'm in the wrong place. Well, okay, I know what it is. 36. Okay, I was just going to look there. And verse 26. Okay, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I will put, this is verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. If you mark your Bible, it's the next word. And what? Cause. See that word cause? I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. I'm going to spell cause to you, because you probably, you may not know how to spell it. It's G-R-A-C-E. Grace is not like graciousness, but rather it's the ability to obey. That's what it is. It's the, the ability to obey God. I will put my spirit within you and what? Cause you to what? Obey. That's, that's the grace. So then in the new covenant, see in the old covenant, they, had to, they were on their own concerning obedience and they failed. In the new covenant, the Lord has not made it easy for us, but rather he's given us the ability to obey. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you. So then... We have that enabling power. Now, in the outworking of this, I'm going to, we're just going to look at a verse, and this won't take real long because I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the outworking of this, and how this works, this ability that the Lord has given to obey. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read verse 6. I just want to make a comment about it. Wherefore... I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Just one comment. I have spoken at big meetings of, of where there's been one, two, three thousand people, but I don't like it. And I go out of my way to avoid a meeting like that. I like house meetings very much, small meetings. Why? Paul said the gift that's in you by the what? The putting on of my hands. You, you cannot minister to two or three thousand people where there's direct... See, it's impossible to impart into that. 
What's important is not facts and information, but rather what? Impartation. It's that which flows into a life. It's the anointing. It's the impartation of the Spirit. It's not facts and information, but rather impartation through the anointing. The anointing imparts life. Jesus said, the words that I speak, a word, for instance, if I say motorcycle, you understand it because immediately you got an image of a gadget with two wheels. If I say automobile, well, it can vary, but, but you add two more wheels. If I say horse, the wheels come off and four legs go on. <laughs> you see, because you see, we change. If I say elephant, you add another gadget in the front in your mind see because you understand so then words is made up of images a language is made up of images then you've got those things that amplify limit and connect that's a language so when 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 i can think in a language when i see an image when i hear a word in any language if i now i know a little bit of spanish but very little but i only know it when i when i hear a word i translate it to english and that the, the the image i see is english so i really don't know it if I knew Spanish, I'd see the image in Spanish or whichever language. But Jesus said, you see, when I said those things, you got an image. Now, suppose Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are what? Spirit. Okay, what image do you have? You don't. You better not. Maybe a white sheet in Halloween. <laughs> see, you really don't. Spirit and what? Life. You know someone's why he's alive or dead, but really, what's, what's life? See, these are abstract. Their qualities, their, their, their spirit, they relate to the heavens, to the spirit, to, to God as spirit. And, and so then through the anointing, the human, the earthly realm, facts, information, the letter of the word becomes spirit and life. And we're lifted into that dimension. But it has to, it's only happens through the anointing and then we receive it by impartation. So then when I speak, the, the, the words, you know, all these words that are coming out that I'm saying, they're like the cargo in the dump truck. See, the dump truck is the, the, the conveyor. See, that's, that's the anointing, that dump truck. And it's got a cargo. And as that moves out, it's spirit and life. It becomes spirit and life. It's the words. It's full of words. But by the time it gets to you, it's translated. If it's anointed, if that anointing is the ineffective. In other words, if it's not, you're just hearing facts and information. And that's just not going to get us anywhere. The gift that's in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. All the negatives, the things that hinder, that hold us down, the earthly things, the things that relate to the present earthly scheme of things. What's going to happen in the year 2000 or, you know, our futures and insecurities and the stock market and, you know, and things crash and the banks close and, you know, all these earthly things. The Spirit, God hath not given us the spirit of fear because we're being prepared not for this realm but for the heaven, for the kingdom, for the earthly realm, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, just for a few moments, we're going to run through this power. I'm still using a King James translation and I've tried to switch a couple times and I've just never succeeded. But Acts 1.8 Let's just turn there. This is one of the primary reasons I cannot find another translation that translates Acts 1-8 right. I have yet to find a translation anywhere that translates Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. If you have a King James, what's the next word? If you have a different translation, what's the next word? when that's wrong power's never a gift you don't get power when you receive you get power when after now i'm going to give you an example it's in luke chapter 4 and then we're going to just keep your place there because i want just a couple more comments luke chapter 4 jesus was baptized he came up out of the water the heavens opened the father spoke this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased the dove descended upon him and jesus being luke chapter 4 verse 1 jesus being what full of the holy ghost i mean full of the holy ghost 
returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now verse 14, this is at the end of 40 days. And Jesus returned in what? In what? The power. So he went into the wilderness in what? Fullness, and he came out in power because the fullness became reality. I used to question, I, I, had, I had some very real questions about healing. And, I, and for years, I had some, some questions. And one, in the early days of Pinecrest, this would have been 1969, right back over in here, just right back, right up here in the landing and back over, I was up in the, there's an attic up overhead with a suspended ceiling. I was, I was up there walking on the rafters. I slipped and I fell through, landed on the floor 12 feet below on the concrete floor. Spent a week in the hospital. And I came out on crutches, absolutely in agony. If I walked, if I tried to walk any distance, I went into a cold chill. And I could hardly walk. I lost the joint in my elbow to this day. I always say, I can see, you know, you know we could be able to turn our hand. Well, I can shake hands, but I can't take an offering. <laughs> my, I lost, I can't see my hand. There's, there's no, I just can't turn it. But the Lord never, never healed that to remind me. But I felt, I, I came out of the hospital in agony, and I was to speak at a little church about 120 miles south of here. And it was absolutely impossible. I was just absolute agony. And I asked a man to go. And I thought, well, I'm miserable. No matter if I sit down, I felt miserable. If I stood up, I couldn't lay down, sit down. Uh, it, was just, it was just antagonizing. And I thought, well, I'll go. And somehow I sat through the service, just somehow just the best I could. At the end of the service, they prayed for me. Just a very small, probably 20 people I was prayed for. I saw... When I was prayed for, I saw, not, this was not a vision, I saw with my physical eyes an orange ball of fire move, I saw it move slowly right across the room and I watched it. When, it. when it went into me, when it did, I felt heat. I felt heat go right down through me. I heard with my physical ears, I heard my back snap. I felt it actually vibrate and I heard it. So I was absolutely profoundly healed. But not only was I healed, I saw it, and I heard it and I felt it. <laughs> See, I wasn't just all at once I was healed. But I saw this ball of fire. I watched it come across the room. I felt the heat. I felt my back actually vibrate like, and I heard it snap. Now, I could never doubt healing again. See, it wouldn't say, well, all, all at once I'm better. Maybe it just happened. No, I saw, I saw it. I felt it. I heard it. Now, see, there was an authority because why? I had an experience. Ye shall receive power when? After. After. See, when Jesus ministered, no man sp speaks as this man, for he speaks as one having authority. Why? The Word became flesh. See, the Word personalized. That happens in experience. The result of experience is power. Because we've experienced it. It's a reality. We know that it works. There's many things in that area could share. So power is never a gift. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's the same word, power. The same word, power. So how do you receive power? By waiting on the Lord. You, you receive power after what? You wait on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall receive strength. Even the young men, men shall be weak. They'll, they'll fail. They'll, but they that wait. Well, wait means you spend T-I-M-E, time. So then that means ye shall receive power when? After. Never when. Power is not a gift. It's something that's the result. And I have a concept. I, I have the reality. Because I was standing at one time. I stood right at the throne of God. And I have a sense of, of receiving in a class one time. This would have been years ago. This was the last class before a Christmas break. And everybody had their suitcases packed and they were already traveling. And it's difficult. And I said, when our hands have something to do with this, and I can't turn, I said, but when our hands are this way, we're waiting, you see, we're receiving something. When we worship, we turn our hands, see, and it's flowing out. And I said, now, everyone, hold your hands this way. Now, just, just, just look up to the Lord. 
And I said, do you feel something coming in? Do you feel it? And they said, yes. Now, I said, turn your hands over this way. See, that's worship going out. I said, now, there's something start. Now, do you feel it? And, and they literally shouted because the Lord just demonstrated that so real. You see, experience. And when you experience that, when you have that feeling, it adds a reality and authority because the Lord has personally made himself real. The Lord appearing in the last days is part of this because the rule of a rod of iron requires, the apostolic requires the presencing of the Lord. That presence is going to give us a boldness and authority that we can come to in no other way beyond anything that we're capable of short of that. And we're going to experience it for the purpose of empowering us for that end time work of the Lord in bringing Satan down and bringing the nations of this world into the kingdom. So then, you see, ye shall see power when? After. That's the first one. Power, God hath not given us, not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Now, there's three words for love in Greek. There's actually four, but there's three primary ones. Eros. That's not in the Bible. That's the love of a salesman. You walk in a store and look at something and that salesman will love you to death until you buy it. And then he'll forget you ever lived. Because he's not interested in you, he's interested in the commission. See, he's loving to get. Now that's all right because he's got to work for a living. But he'll love you to death until you buy it. I think you know that. And once you buy it, you've had it. <laughs> that's eros. Phileo. That's mutual love. That's love that responds to love. That's experiential love. Then agape. God so loved the world that he gave. Eros, one way, one, love one way in. Phileo, two ways. I love and I receive in return from that love. And then agape. God so loved the world that he gave. Now in Proverbs, I love them that love me. See, that's love responding to love. It's love that responds. Now, there's something interesting here. For years, I wondered. We're going to look in Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, phileo, this phileo, this is Philadelphia, phileo, the city of brotherly love. See, that's that love, that, that little love, love that responds to love. These things saith he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, because you have a little strength. See, they've come into that experiential relationship of, 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 of ye shall see power after, spending time, experience, a personal experience with the Lord. This is experiential. And because they have that experience, verse 9, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan to come and worship before your feet. Now, I, that's a powerful thing. I'll make even your enemies to worship at your feet, to bow. And I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. Now, I was always taught that agape is the highest love. God so loved that he gave. Agape. And I thought, Lord, if you've set before the church at Philadelphia an open door that no one can shut, and, even, and, and for that, the people in that church, even their enemies will bow to them, that's powerful. Lord, why isn't this church in Agapeville? Why is it in Phileoville? I love them that what? That love me. Now, I want to say something. I don't, this, I don't have this problem here, but have you, have you ever met someone you just plain don't like? You don't know why, but you just plain don't like them? And there's somebody that really did you bad in church and you really have feelings? And the evangelist comes and says, turn around and tell the person next to you that you love them. So you go through a little gymnastic. And you say within yourself, I really don't like you, but in my will, I love you. That's agape. But this church is where? With, with this power, it's where? It's in phileo. That means you have to like that person. You don't tell them you love them out of your will. You've got to like them. I want to say something. If any one of us had a church, a body of believers, we were part where everybody really liked everybody else. The power, I don't think this world has yet to see the power of that kind of a body. The church at what? Phileo, Philadelphia, where we all like each other, really like each other. The enemy has a way. 
that we all have feelings and we have attitudes, opinions about each other and things that hinder. And then we say, well, we smile and say, I love you. Well, I really don't like you, but I will to love you. Well, in that sense, like is stronger than love because love, like comes from the heart and love can come from the will. It can come from the heart. But see, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power. I'm spending time. The next one, I've got my relationships in order. They're right. See, they're right before the Lord. I dealt with my relationships. And then the third one, a sound mind. That has nothing to do with loose gears in our head. <laughs> but rather, it means a disciplined spirit. See, it's a spirit of discipline. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. See, that's an action on our part where we are going to pay a price. We submit to the dealings, the workings. There's an obedience. The willing and the obedient shall eat the good of the land. To him who overcometh. How do I overcome? Through obedience to the purpose, to the will of God, when I just plain don't feel like it. One of the primary struggles that many of us have is when the Lord comes on a cold night about 3 o'clock in the morning and tells us to get up and pray. And the bed's nice and warm and, it, and, when, and it's cold out there. And immediately a, a warfare begins. Are we going to obey or go back to sleep? And the banner that's come, that I think was just made, there's an article by Walter Butler went through that. There's a, a, an article about that, the, the battle that he had in that area that's really an, enlightening. And so you see, so then I deal with my life to bring myself not only into the place where I'm submitted, my relationships, but now I'm going to respond to that voice as a trumpet. See, I'm, I'm going to respond to that, that call. Of, immediately I was in the Spirit and behold a throne. So then I become, become obedient to that which the Lord shows me. And the Lord will begin to take us through many things. So I'm just going to share one more thing. It's in Matthew 13. When we begin to see this, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a disciplined spirit, a life of discipline. When the kingdom, the kingdom is as a grain of mustard seed. See, a sower went forth to sow. So it's not how much I have, it's what I do with what I have that's important. So Matthew chapter 13. Verse 31. Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seed. So then... If I have so little of God in my life that it takes a microscope to almost to see it, that's really not the problem that we may think it is. It's not how much I have, it's what I do with what I have. But when it is grown, it's the greatest amongst herbs. An herb is medicinal, and you get the value out of it by grinding it, crushing it, boiling it. And when we submit our lives to the Lord, the enemy begins. He works on us, but not only that, people work on us, others, they take advantage. I was deeply hurt by a man a good many years ago. I mean deeply hurt. And I found myself hating him. And I had to deal with that. And finally, I managed to get clear and forgive him. I got him totally forgiven. And then the day came, years later, the Lord dealt with me. And the Lord said that I was to write to him and apologize to him. And so I wrote and apologized. And what made it worse was he accepted the apology. <laughs> because I, I was right, he was absolutely wrong. And I was the one that had to apologize. Why? Because the Lord was after me. He was dealing with something in me. And there was something being ground. That, see, that, that herb that I'm becoming... And, and it has to be, to be of any real value, there has to come a brokenness in our spirit, in our lives, a dependence, a reduction of our independence. And the Lord has ways to get at us. This herb is, is reduced. It's the greatest amongst herbs. Now here's something interesting. When we submit our lives to the conditionings, the workings, see, the kingdom, and we shared this the other night, and this would take a long time to really get this out right. 
Paul prayed from an out-resurrection. Remember that? An out-resurrection from among the living dead. Now here's something. See, this herb, when I submit to the dealings, the workings of the Spirit, I handled it in a right attitude. The wayside, the stones, the thorns, that I, I can come to good soil, the dealings of the Lord, the workings to bring me through. See, it's, and, and this, this herb is the greatest amongst herbs. But it says it be, this is, an herb is a, like a bush, a plant. It says it becomes a what? Tree. Now that's a mutation. If the evolutionists could prove a mutation, they would be in glory. That's a change from one species to another. And this is a change from the church to the kingdom, a tree of righteousness, where we become that tree planted, the river of life. We become a part of the tree of life with all manner of fruit for the healing of the nations. See, it, it, this herb, if I submit, it becometh the tree. That means through an intervention of God, I am placed on kingdom ground and I begin to funk that righteousness, peace, joy. The kingdom, was in, the, it's within, but it works out. See, well, when we pray, we shouldn't say, thy will be done on earth. What's important is that isn't, the earth's not the problem. The evolutionists don't know that, nor all these people worrying about you know, all the stuff out there. If thy will be done in earth, when it's done in earth, it'll be done on earth. So then, is the greatest amongst herbs and becometh a tree. And if we'll become that tree of righteousness, that mutation, when we come to kingdom ground, it said all the birds of the air will come and lodge in your branches. In other words, if you've got something, if you've got the goods, if you've got something of the kingdom, people are going to search you out, they're going to find you, the birds, those that are thirsty, hungry, seeking, they're going to come and lodge in the branches of your experience. Amen. Now that's powerful, but it's very real. It's not methodology, but it's coming into such an experience that others can sense that you've become that tree planted by the river of life with all manner of fruit for the healing. We don't need to be, the tree of life is not in heaven. We don't, we, and people in heaven don't need to be healed. It's for the healing of the nations. We become that tree. And, and, but it comes from that herb that's crushed ground, dealt with. We, we submit ourselves. Where, where that, the power, the authority, we wait. Then we're dealt with. We're reduced. And then, through that mutation, we become a tree of righteousness. And many will come and receive the birds of the air, the spiritually hungry. They're searching. They're looking for somebody that's got the goods, that's got something. And they'll find you and they'll travel. To where you are. I mean, they'll travel long distance if you've got it. And you see, so our problem is not methodology, but it's in becoming something that we can become a blessing that others can come and partake of our lives. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. The Lord's preparing a people in this day, getting us ready for something, the kingdom. And as we submit, ye shall receive power after not when. And I'm, I'm praying somebody's going to come up with a good translation that's got it right. The first thing I do when a new translation comes out, I read Acts 1.8. <laughs> okay, let's all stand together. And we're, ju we're just going to pray and dismiss and appreciate tremendously your patience and the opportunity that I've had to share. It's just been so good. And I trust you'll be back. I'll be here in the evening for a week next year and I trust you'll be back by the grace of God. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word, for that which you're speaking into our hearts, into our lives. And we thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Help us to grasp, to understand, to come to that knowledge, that understanding, Lord, that will take us beyond the gift of salvation into our preparation for kingdom, ministry, life, O oh Lord, where we become indeed a tree of righteousness with all manner of fruit for the healing of the nations. You're seeking out such, Lord, and we're asking, Lord, hallelujah, that there might be that impartation, that into our lives from this message that will challenge us, Lord, that will push beyond to become that which you would have us to be. Help us to hear, to understand, and to receive. We thank you, Lord. 
And now, Lord, as we dismiss, we thank you for a beautiful week, the ministry, the opportunities we've had in the chapel, the prayer meeting in the morning, the chapel, the classes, our fellowship in the afternoon, the services in the evening, and then our fellowship in the dining room. And we just thank you for all this, Lord, the opportunity that we've had. And we ask, Lord, as we travel tomorrow, many of us, that there will be protection on the roads. And we thank you and we ask you to bring us back, Lord, again in, the, in your time. And we ask it in the name that's worthy, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.